to make sure you hear us. Yeah, that would help, right? Yeah. Can you say something, Tom? Oh, say the something. damn steam okay. engines. Go ahead. Can't hear okay. words. That's true. Okay, why don't you guys stand over here in front of the steam engines? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, one of the things we're looking at this uh, jacket, and we note that the, the large brass uh, rivet that hold this together is of the older style. Back up here, you can see a much smaller rivet. That suggests that those are newer sheets. Oh. So the possibilities of these sheets that have these brass rivets may be older, might even be early enough to still have Russia iron on them. We know that this locomotive originally had Russia iron on it when it left the factory, and all the other DNT locomotives did too, uh, all the 19th century ones. Is that, what, is that what you see, the blue boiler? No. Yeah, yeah, it, it, well, sort of blue. The problem is that all the things that you see out here are modern trying to simulate Russia iron. Okay. And it, it's similar or close. So for instance, uh, Chris developed a chemical bluing process that's been used on the Empire, uh, or on the Eureka rather, and on the uh, Glenbrook. That's much closer to the historic color of Russia iron. Okay. The paint that's on like the Genoa that was an earlier attempt. It's way, way too light in color. Okay. Um, but that was, again, attempting to represent Russia iron. Um, we now actually have a number of different samples of Russia iron. There are Russia iron samples that were found on the Genoa when it was restored. There are Russia iron samples that were found on the Inyo when it was restored. Oh, wow. There are Russia iron samples that were found on the Tahoe at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania when it was restored. Okay. So we have all of those. There's also, we have Russia iron from other sources. I've personally got about half a dozen samples of real Russia iron from different sources. Well, so so we, we, at this point, we have a pretty good idea of what Russia iron looked like because we have actual Russia iron samples. So what do you have to do to find out and verify? Is that turning it apart or? Well, you have to be able to, to look at, at clean clean pieces to, to look for some of the characteristics things. So when Russia iron is produced, it was, part of the process was planishing it, which is hammering it. So the surface, it has a little stipple to it. It's not perfectly flat. Okay. It has a little texture to it. And so that's one of the keys along with the color and look. Let's go back to this. So anyway, Russia iron was actually made in Russia. Okay. It was a crafts process, not an industrial process. So you had the iron master who would say, for instance, you, you heat it up until it's that color. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, and you, you hammer it here and you do this and this. And it's because the crafts master had the knowledge, had learned knowledge of how to tell when to transition to the different processes. Um, so Russia iron was used extensively in this country for locomotive jackets and machinery jackets. Oh wow. Because at the in the 19th century they didn't have paint that was heat resistant. Oh interesting. So when you had hot surfaces, the the Russia iron is sheet iron, which is then through this process is an oxidation reduction process that turns the surface layers into a stable iron oxide, which in the mineral world is the mineral magnetite. Okay. So that's the iron oxide that's on the surface that gives the color to the Russia iron. It is also a very tight crystalline structure, so it is rust resistant. Ah, okay. Not rust proof, but rust resistant or corrosion resistant. That's why they used it on the, the locomotives. They would need to keep oiling it and, and all and protecting it to make sure, because it will ultimately rust. Okay. Um, yeah, and I appreciate your explaining this. But I'm pretty, yeah. Then the other thing is it's only on the surface. So with abrasion, you can go through the surface oxide back to the base metal, oh. which will get you the lighter colors. Okay. Because it, then it's just the, the sheet metal, not the, the oxide. 
that's giving the color. So then I guess something I'm, I'm kind of ignorant about, I mean, how thick is that metal? That's it, really, wow. It's just, I... just oh. sheet metal. Wow. It's just huh. sheet metal. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you look here, I mean, this isn't rush iron, but that's an example of sheet metal. I mean, so that's about how thick it is, roughly. Well, huh. So this is a formed seam where they, they've bent it over like this. Okay, I see what you're saying. So that's oh. what that seam is. In fact, here you can see a piece of it. Here you can see uh, the thickness right there where my finger is. Oh yeah, you can feel it right there. Yeah. Wow. Huh. So that's that's all that is. That's um, funny. I do I do web and video stuff, and so I like a guy like this knows a million times what I know, and then you know what ten thousand times what he knows. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> we have different knowledge. He knows a lot of things I don't know. I know a lot of things he doesn't know. That's the nature of life. Well, the question is, can you fix a broken coupler? <laughs> Did you so, have some questions for him, Tom? Because I'm kind of, I'm kind uh, of covering the layperson's point of view. Uh, you could take a picture of it on the other side with the rush, the little part that they found. Well, then there's also right there is a little bit that has gone in, and what I'm suggesting is that when they take this jacket down, they treat it a little carefully and that ultimately they, they put in paint stripper to get all the layers of paint off of it. And then we can really assess what may be rush iron and what may not be rush iron. Interesting. Okay. What was this before, this right here? What? Just, that was uh, ri ri riveted on. There was a, unless that was in a different sheet someplace. They, they might have, or it might have been an, an earlier check valve. The earlier injector check valve may have been back here instead of up there. Pretty far back, huh? 1872. And, and some of those early check valves. <laughs> So some of the early injector check valves. So this was built, it had crosshead pumps only. Yes. And then later they start adding in the the check valve, the injectors. And so early check uh, injectors often would come in back here instead of all the way up there. And so it's, it's in line possible. with the pump too. Huh? Yeah. So it, it might have been, it might have been that, or there might have been something else that that led them to go in there. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, looking at these rivets, I'm not sure how old that is either. Um, That's old, yeah. So, so there, there's a lot that we can learn from this as we take it apart if we, like I say, treat it carefully so that we can actually study it and, and figure out exactly what's going on. This is from the Genoa here. Okay. They interchanged some of the parts. Yeah. The Genoa, the truck. Fairly uh, readily. Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, uh, on the Empire, the tender trucks under the Empire today were built in 1869 for the Virginia. Really? Yeah. Which was an, an earlier engine on the VNT. Oh, wow. That's the four? What? That was the four. Okay. And so they could simply, but they were all sort of interchangeable Baldwin parts so that you could swap them back and forth. Uh, so in it's the not shop. Not much on a truck, at any rate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, something like a truck. Yeah. was easy enough to, to swap around and, and stuff like that. So the one of the interesting things is the earlier star, the equalizer bar from the Virginia is curved, radius all the way. And then later Baldwin changed where it went down and had a flat section and up. And so that's what this engine had, you know, by 72. Uh, that's what the Empire originally had. That's what the Genoa has and, and all that. So when we looked at the Empire and we looked at those equalizers, what's going on here? When we uh, had it all apart, we found the Baldwin class numbers stamped into the truck and identified it as the Virginia. They, you, Genoa's got the Reno trucks on it. Mm -hmm. They swapped them and then they swapped the side bearings too, from sure. the front to the rear. And and so what mm. they what it is, is some of this stuff is just sort of universal parts and, and it's easy enough in, in the shop to just swap them around. It's like, okay, we need to put the truck back under. Well, we've got several trucks here. This one's ready to go, and this one's ready to go, and yep. put it in, now it goes. Can I ask a really ignorant question? You work for the California State Railroad Museum or something like that? I or retired what? from CSRM four years ago. Okay. But I, I worked there for about 20 years as the well, curator of history and technology. Uh, I worked up here for about nine years as curator of history. 
And before all of that, when CSRM was being developed and we were doing the restoration, I worked in the restoration shop as a historical researcher. Okay, thanks. I thought you looked familiar, but I yeah. Just so I've been question. around for, for that, and I was involved in a lot of those things. Wow, that's amazing. So. Well, uh, did you uh, have any more questions for him? I think that's that, the second generation generator. On this. That's that's, that's an early generator. Yeah. That is a really interesting early generator, and. I'm not sure, but that may be the type that was originally designed for arc lights. Oh, oh wow. I've been just recently starting to study the early electrical arc light uh, headlight systems. Original and, PVC caps. Yeah, yeah <laughs> indeed. <laughs> from the sprinkler system from 1872. That, that's the one. Keeps the water out for right now. That's perfect. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah, that's really important. 